Matthew 18, I want you to focus. I know Matthew chapter 18 is a subject in a, uh, a very important <laughs> portion of Scripture. Um, some of it for church discipline, but also, I guess really all of it is church discipline. If we want to stop and think about how we are to act and how we are to live uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, again, as was mentioned this morning, that is what matters. Living for Jesus is what matters. What we do for Christ that will last. The gold, uh, silver, and the precious metals that we can lay aside. Uh, lay not aside the treasures upon this earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but and thieves do break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What is important is what we do for Jesus on a daily basis. And uh, I want to encourage you today, uh, as we look at this portion of Scripture, we are actually going to be in this portion of Scripture for the both services, the morning service and also the afternoon service. But I want you to focus, as we will be focusing, on the law of forgiveness today. And I entitled our message today, Forgive Them. Forgive Them. I want you to think about this subject of forgiveness today, and it is something that I believe plagues our independent Baptist churches. It plagues our individuals within our independent Baptist churches. We can go to the degree of even discussing uh, there may be some here today who have left another independent Baptist church, and they have come to this independent Baptist church. I am not going to tell you that there is never a time or a place for that. There's never a time or a place for a move or for a transfer of membership. Uh, I would never say that because I know sometimes God just lays it out that way. God makes it perfectly clear. For whatever reason, sometimes God wants folks to move when there's not even a problem. God says, you know what, I want you to go help these people. Those kind of things happen. In fact, if that never happened, I wouldn't be here today. If God had put in my heart to leave my good, solid uh, uh King James Bible believe in church uh, and to come here, I wouldn't be here today. But God put it in my heart to transfer my membership, move my membership from Amazing Grace Baptist Temple in Millersburg, Ohio to Erie, Pennsylvania, Southside Baptist Church. There are reasons and times and situations where God moves us. I'm just using the church as an illustration or as an example. But as people leave one Baptist church and they go to another Baptist church, if we're not careful, what we carry along is something called unforgiveness and something that carries bitterness with it. And there's a lot of things and a lot of repercussions of our, our not forgiving people. Now, that's just one instance of the church. We also have instances and circumstances where we may get fired from a job. Um, or we may lose our job, or the plant may shut down or something, and we develop this uh, unforgiveness in our heart, uh, and this bitterness in our heart towards someone or something. That's a job situation. We can develop uh, things in our own families where we will not forgive our wife or we'll not forgive our husband for the things that they said, you know, or, um, you know, something that they've said that they've come across and it hurt our feelings. And we can find that in our church situations where we, uh, our feelings are hurt because maybe we weren't asked to do something. Maybe you weren't asked to give a testimony or maybe you weren't asked to teach a Sunday school class. And we develop within our, our hearts something that happens uh, that we, we get angry at those people. And maybe someone has hurt us or offended us, and it's legitimately so, but we cannot forgive them. We get to the point where we, are, we live our lives angry at them. And the Bible is very specific about forgiveness that unless we forgive, God will not forgive us. Yet forgiveness as is an unforgiveness or the lack thereof of forgiveness is a problem that we deal with quite often in our churches today where that pastor did something to me. I, I want to, not just because I'm a pastor, but I want to let you in on a little secret. Please listen to me. I want to let you in on a little secret. Pastors are human also. Pastors make mistakes also. You ever made a mistake on your checkbook? 
I appreciate Miss Seymour. I think she does it probably the right way. I don't. She, I, I like to write in my checkbook and pen. And I, I don't know why. I just have always, I've always done that, and I prefer a pen. Part of the reason I don't like a pencil is just because it smears. Usually, I find myself smearing pencil marks and all that kind of stuff. And pens do too. But for me, I just prefer to write it down with a pen. But a lot of times, I find myself, I wrote down the wrong number, or I forgot to write something down, and I have to change, I have to correct my, my checkbook. For her, she can just erase it. For me, I have to cross it out and put it on the line above. We all make mistakes, though, don't we? We all make mistakes. And I'm not saying that there's never a mistake that a pastor would make that it wouldn't cause you to say, you know what, it's time for us to move on. But please, can I get you to understand, we are human. We get tired. We get weary. Uh, you know, driving home last night after, uh, you know, driving basically nine hours on Friday and then nine hours yesterday, essentially, uh, you know, I'm getting, starting to get a little bit weary. I think sometimes people feel that sometimes pastors should never get weary. Obviously, they're filled with the power of God, right, Alton? They're filled with the power of God and they don't ever get tired. When yet the Bible says that Jesus, and when we get tired, what do we do? Are we at our best when we're tired? No. Even driving behind the wheel, when we are tired, that's why sometimes it's better to just pull off, take a quick nap or something, or pull off and go to Rural King, right? I mean, that's probably the best thing you could do. Go to a place like that and, and look at some cowboy stuff and that kind of thing. That's exciting, you know, but those things, it's time to, time to get some refreshment. And the Bible says, even with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, that he rested. He, had to, he was weary. He was tired. He was hungry. He's human. I'm not just preaching for pastors, but can I tell you the reality is, is that we are all human. If we would expect to come into an independent Baptist church and never to see a problem or never to see someone make a mistake, there's, that's not going to happen. Now, the reality is, is when we do sin, when we do make a mistake that causes problems for other people, then I believe there is a spirit of repentance that we don't see much of today, of forgiveness. In fact, I was talking to a pastor friend of mine just recently who had a family leave his church. And I was talking to him and I could see, I could sense, I could feel his heart. He said, you know, the way I handled the situation was wrong. I messed up. And I don't like the term called uh, of eating crow, but he said, I've apologized to them. He said, I ate crow so many times in the last several months, trying to encourage that family and let them know that I was wrong. They were right and, 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 and asked them that they would forgive me. And you know what? They wouldn't and they won't come back to church. Here's a man of God who people expect not to make mistakes, who acknowledges that he makes a mistake admits to those people and says, listen, I'm sorry. And to be honest with you, I don't know the full mistake, the full extent of the mistake that he made, but I know this, it was not a mistake that somebody should leave the church over. It was not he killed one of their kids. It was not he threw them under the bus. It was not a situation where it was something, it, where he changed doctrines. He didn't change his doctrinal stance. I know this man personally. I know where he stands. If he's, if, uh, if he might be stronger on the King James Bible than I am, and more staunch about it. And he said, "I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry." And I believe he really is. In fact, when somebody tells us we're sorry, they're sorry. Who are we to judge whether they actually are or not? Now I understand there's a spirit of their attitude. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. And then they, you know, you. You kind of know in your heart, you know, they're not really sorry. But the scripture tells us that we're supposed to forgive anyways. Forgive anyways. And so as we look at this scripture, the law of forgiveness, as we see scripturally what we are to do, I want you to think today, is there something in your heart? Maybe it's a family member who's done you wrong. Maybe they've never came and apologized to you, but I believe scripturally, biblically, 100% that whether they come to you or not, we have to learn as Christians, if we're going to be better, Alton, if you're going to be better at the things that you know you're supposed to do as a Christian, you're going to have to take that initiative, use some self-control and say, I'm going to apply myself. If we're going to be better as Christians, we cannot go forward with baggage of that of unforgiveness in our hearts and in our lives. 
I will never forgive so and so in the church for what they did or what they said. You know, I wore, and usually it's silly things. I wore a brand new dress to church. Brother Griffiths, I think, made a message, mention of this, or somebody, maybe it was Sam, I don't remember, at camp. I wore a brand new dress to church, and you never even told me it looked nice. And so I'm mad at you, and I'll never forgive you for that. I didn't even realize you had a new outfit on. Is the truth? But we will hold those things and never forgive. You and I as Christians are to forgive even when they don't ask for forgiveness. The Bible says, and you say, well, I don't know about that. Look at what Jesus did. How many people ask for forgiveness for their sins? Now, there's a lot, thank the Lord for that, but how many do not? And Jesus still said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus Christ has the, is the supreme example, the supreme chief authority on what forgiveness is all about. And may I encourage you to forgive people. Let's look real quickly. I'm not going to read down through the portion of Scripture. I think you know the portion of Scripture for the most part. If you don't, we'll read down through most of it. Just I'm not going to read it first and go in for sake of time. My son apparently seems to be long-winded just like me. So, anyways, I want you to notice verse 21. In verse 21, the Bible says this, Then came Peter to him, Matthew 18, 21, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how all shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? And Peter says this till seven times. I think mean, Peter already understands that the number seven in the Bible is an important number. It's the number of perfection. So if, I, if, if somebody asks me to forgive them, how often should I forgive them? Seven times? Is that good enough? Is that enough? So I want you to think about this first of all. Number one is the million dollar question. How often should I forgive someone who offends me or hurts me? Brother Griffiths preached a good message about offended. There's a lot of Christians sitting in churches today that are offended over everything. Yeah. I'm offended over the color of the pews. I'm offended that that preacher preaches so long. I'm offended that he touched on a subject today that hurts my feelings. I'm offended that he stepped on my toes. I'm offended that we can't be like everybody else. I'm offended that this and offended over that. And we live in a day and age where you just look at somebody wrong and they're offended about something. I want to encourage you today as we think about the million dollar question, how often are we to forgive someone who has hurt us or bothered us? How often should we forgive? I've thought about this often. What happens if somebody does something to one of my children? What am I supposed to do? Oh, pastor, you're touching a subject I don't want to talk about. I have to be honest with you, my humanly flesh would desire if somebody hurts my children, and I'm talking about, let's say, in a lethal way, I would want to retaliate humanly back and do the same thing that they, that they did to my children. If not worse, obviously, if it's a lethal situation. There are things that people can do to your children that I would hope you would never want to do back to somebody else's children. Uh, but in reality, if somebody came and took a gun and shot one of my children, my flesh would say, you know what, I'm going to go back with a gun and do the same thing. But spiritually speaking, biblically speaking, and let's just make this known right now, the spiritually think, spiritual way to think, the biblical way, is the correct way. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Our ways, our thoughts, we may have thoughts, we may have ideas, and I'm not saying there's never a time to defend yourself. If somebody takes a gun and shoots one of my children, I promise you I'm not going to say, listen, I forgive you, if they're still trying to shoot the rest of my kids. If I have a way to control that, I'm going to do that. I don't believe that's what the Bible's talking about. But here is after the fact is what I'm talking about. When something like that happens, do I just go because they did something to my children? Am I going to go ram a car into them because they ran the car into my children? Is that the way we're to handle it? Biblically speaking, is the way that we should look at and prepare our hearts and our lives to do exactly what God says. The million dollar question is, is how often should we forgive? This person, and usually it's not a lethal situation, usually it tends to be somebody, hey, he borrowed 20 bucks from me and he's never paid me back. I'm never going to forgive him for never paying me back. How often should we forgive? It's the million dollar question. How often, when somebody hurts my feelings in the church, 
or somebody says something, or that pastor steps on my toes, how often should I forgive? The million dollar question. I want you to give you the million dollar answer, or the master's answer today. And what he says in verse 22, which is often misinterpreted, I believe, it says, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. If the math is correct, seven times seven is forty-nine. You want to add the zero, four hundred and ninety times. But I don't necessarily believe that's what God's talking about. What I believe Jesus is talking about is just the idea. You just keep forgiving. When somebody does something against you, when somebody treads upon you, you do exactly what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And by the way, did not Jesus practice? Did he not practice what he preached? Yeah. Of course he did. On the cross of Calvary, every one of us hurt, offended, put upon Jesus Christ the sins of the entire world. Every one of us in his his key words were this, Father, forgive them. I guarantee you, you and I, every one of us in this room, have offended God. Now, we did have some little ones, so maybe I, I'll, I'll be careful with that. But I will say this, adult-wise, teenage-wise, I guarantee you, we have offended God's laws more than 490 90 times. But I will also guarantee you, I am so thankful for the grace of God and the mercy of God and the goodness of God that He's still faithful and just to forgive us. Right. How often have we sinned against an almighty God? Yet God is forgiving towards us. But the minute somebody offends us, buddy, this is a different story. It's a whole different story when I get offended, when I get bothered, when somebody hurts me. Jesus says, I say until seven times 70. 490 times. Keep on forgiving and just keep on forgiving and keep, keep on forgiving. You say, that's hard to do. It really is. You don't think it was hard for Jesus Christ? You, why do you think he came to, to the Lord? Father, if it be, if thou, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. He knew what he was going to face. He wasn't just going to take my sins upon his back, which would be heavy enough for any man to carry. He was going to take everyone's sins upon his back. What a cup to be taken, to be, to be drank. I can't even imagine what Jesus went through and on the cross after he had faced the punishment that you and I deserve, he still says, Father, forgive them. God, please forgive them. Forgive them. I honestly think you and I don't honestly understand every time we sin against an almighty God what it does to our Heavenly Father. He says, for they know not what they do. You realize when our children sin against an almighty God, we have relatives, loved ones right now that I would encourage you to pray for. Not only does it break our heart, but if it breaks our hearts, what do you think it does to God's heart? That's good. Right. When our relatives could care less what God's word says. And we become the enemy. I'm sorry, sin is still sin. And I still love them. But what do you think it does to our Savior when we blatantly sin against Him? I could care less what God thinks is what we're truly saying. And Jesus says, I want you to notice the third thing, and that is the mind-blowing story. This story blows my mind. I love those commercials where, you know, you just, they, they, they do the animated thing and somebody's mind just blows up. Because when I think about this story, that's exactly what I think of. It's a mind-blowing story. When we think about the law of forgiveness or lack of forgiveness, unforgiveness, and we think about what, it, what the Scripture tells us of exactly what you... Isn't it amazing that when the shoe's on our foot, it's different? Well, I'm the one that has to deal with it. So, I mean, this is world life changing. But if you have to deal with it, it's no big deal. 
And honestly, that's what we look at when we look at somebody. We go to a funeral and we can say, I don't know if I really... And, and honestly, we, we sometimes we don't understand what they're going through. Brother Brown, I've been thinking a lot lately about your mama. And I, I don't know why. The Lord just put her on my heart a lot. And I, you know, I know she's, she's gone. But I think, you know, we, we look at the... I've never lost my mom. I've not lost my dad. Brother Brian's lost both. And sometimes it's hard for us to have empathy or sympathy or to try to understand what somebody's going through until it's our mom and dad and then we're gloom, despair, and agony on us. It's hard for us to put ourselves in those shoes. I understand that. But when the shoe is on our foot, when the shoe is on somebody else's foot, what really matters is what God's Word says about it. And this is the craziness, if you will, of humanity, of exactly how things work. I want you to look at this story, and it is a mind-blowing story as we consider the million-dollar question, and the master's answer is just keep forgiving. But the mind-blowing story, we see the account in verse 23. There is the king, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. God is going to take, listen, Every knee shall bow, every right. tongue shall right. confess. There will be a day of accountability. Every man shall give an account of himself. Yes, sir. Yeah. There will be an account, and there is a king in heaven. His name is Jesus. God on the throne today is making intercession for you and I. I want Amen. you to know that there is therefore a king dumb in and of heaven, likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. God knows all about it. That's right. He knows what you've done. He knows who you've forgiven. He knows who you haven't forgiven. He knows the sin that you've committed this day and this week and last month and last year. He has an account. And as he opens up, the king opens up this account and he takes account of his servants. In verse 24, we see the owing. We, every one of us, have an account. And many of us, all of us, owe Big time. Look at verse 24. It says, And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Folks, I know you can look at figures and you can say 10,000 talents in the Bible and 10,000 talents compared to today. I'm just going to give you a generic figure that is really probably pretty close to what this man owed the king. You know that you and I, I don't even know if we can put a figure on how much we owe God. Right. We owe Him for our life. We owe Him for our health. We owe Him for our strength. We owe Him for the blessings that we do not deserve. This man owed the king 10,000 talents. Yep. One talent in Bible days, in Bible times, was $400. In a small figure, in being... Being, if we're just trying to just put it simply, this man owes, and we, we, what do we call it? He owes a what? A king's ransom. ransom. That's exactly what this man owed God. And I believe today it's what every one of us owe God. Because yeah. there's an account. Yeah. Yeah. And there's an owing. And listen, the only way we can have that account shrink is when we come before an almighty God and say, God, we need you. Please forgive us. Forgive us as we forgive our debtors. This man owes the king. Let's just use, for instance, today, if you add that up, he owes $4 million. $4 million. How many know of you know what the typical wage in the Old Testament and Bible days was for a worker, for a laborer? Does anybody know? One penny. One penny. He owes $4 million. How many zeros is that? I don't even want to think about it. It's too many for me. How many days would he have to work to pay off his debt to God? Folks, can I tell you this morning, you cannot pay your sin debt. That's right. That's right. I can't pay my sin debt. $4 million in those days, what would it be today? It was I mean, you couldn't make it. You cannot pay that debt. Yeah. I want you to consider the owing. In verse 25, I want you to consider the payment. 
In verse 25 it says, But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. If you don't receive Jesus as your personal Savior, let me just make it as plain as day. This story is telling us that if we don't, we don't have Jesus pay our sin debt for us, we are helpless, hopeless, without, without a hope, and we are going to die and spend and pay our sin debt ourselves in a place called hell. That's right. That's right. We're going to throw you into the lake of fire, is what God says. You owe a sin debt that you cannot pay. What are we talking about today? Forgiveness. What does our sin debt have to do with that? Folks, we owe God so much shame on us when we're not willing to forgive somebody else who stole something small from us. You hurt my feelings today. You made me feel little. You made me feel bad. I'm never going to forget. I don't want to ever see that person again. To the point where we'll run around the store and hide behind a shelf. We'll hide under like little kids do. We'll hide underneath a, a coat rack because there's somebody there that we're mad at and we're not, we don't want to see them ever again. That's good. Here is a man who owed more than he could pay. Way more than he could pay. And as the Lord says, I'm going to make you pay payment for that. I want you to consider verse 26. Hey, listen, when something goes wrong and we need help, we beg for help. Oh, please, somebody help me. But when somebody else has a problem, ah, let them deal with it themselves. What do you think the Levite and the priest would have done if they would have been the ones that would have been beaten on the, on the road? You think they would have wanted the Good Samaritan to come help them? Yeah. Of course they would have. But they go by on the other side. I'm too busy. i got too much stuff to do. I ain't got time on Devin, I hurt my leg. I, I just... Sorry, can't help you today. The payment. You can never pay what you yeah, want. Right. Right. Can I tell you this morning, not only do we see the payment, but we see the plea for patience. We would cry out and say, Lord, please help me. Verse 26 says, The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. I have a feeling... He's trying to make it sound good, but I think the truth is that he knows he couldn't pay it all. But if he can get the Lord to feel sorry for him, maybe, just maybe, he can be forgiven. And he won't lose his wife and his family. And he won't lose his, he won't have to spend eternity in prison, if you will, on this earth. Or for eternity. Yeah. I want you to consider the plea for patience in verse 26. Please be patient with me. In verse 27, I want you to consider the compassion and forgiveness. This is our Lord. We owe the Lord far more, the Lord far more than we can pay. In verse 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. How many times do I have to tell you that Jesus, as he saw the multitudes, was moved with compassion? How many times do we need to realize that when we go to Walmart, we should be moved with compassion for those lost people? How many times do we go? I went last night, we went to a, a fast food restaurant just driving through and went through a drive through and handed somebody a smiley face track. And, and it was funny. I don't even know if the kids saw it, but she grabbed that track and she's trying to pull the stickers off there. She said, I, I thought for sure you gave me some stickers. I said, I just want you to read that after, or after work, you know? Because Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Right. Sin hath left the crimson stain, but his blood. Left me white as snow. Hey, can I tell you this morning, Jesus Christ has paid it all. And as we think about compassion, Jesus was moved with compassion. And it drove him, it behooved him to go to the cross of Calvary. Amen. To die for us because we owe such a sin debt that we cannot pay. And Jesus Christ, and as the example of the Lord or the King, he sees the servant. And as he's crying for mercy, he's moved with compassion. And he looses him. And he forgave him the debt. But boy, doesn't the tide turn. In verse 28, we have been given, we take, our, we take some things, liberties, don't we? God has been so good to us, and if we're not careful, we'll take the liberty and say, well, I'm on my way to heaven, so it doesn't matter if I smoke this cigarette. Yeah. Let's take it a step further. It doesn't matter if I smoke this joint. 
It doesn't matter if I drink this little cup of alcoholic beverage. After all, it's just a seltzer or something that's nothing bad. It's just a wine cooler. And we take the liberty and say, you know what? I'm going to put something into my body that we shouldn't be putting into our body. I'm going to do something with my body and say, you know what? God is so loving and he's so kind. He's so compassionate that he'll forgive me even when I do. That's right. And we do it anyways because we take the grace and mercy of God for, for granted. And we say, he's always just going to forgive me. But can I tell you today... When the shoe's on the other foot, here's what we do. Did you hear about the pastor's son? His car was at the bar last night. Yours was there two months ago. But we'll take someone and we'll drive them into the ground. When what we've done compared to what they've done is the moat and the beam. Right. And we'll never forgive. When look where God has brought you from. Look what God has done for you. In verse 28, we have a sad story. We see violence from a man who was forgiven. What was he forgiven? We called it a king's ransom, did we not? He was forgiven a king's ransom. And that same very man who was forgiven so much. In verse 28, look what happens. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. This is what is going on in Christianity today in the law of forgiveness and unforgiveness. We are saying God forgave me, but I'm not going to forgive you. I, I, God forgave me of so much. He forgave me of that, let's call it $4 million. And here's a servant, of, or of a fellow laborer of mine who I lent 100 pence. Anybody have an idea what 100 pence is? One buck. I'm not even going to try to add up how many days and years it would take to work off $4 million. It would be multiple, 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 multiple lifetimes. Yeah. You got it, Devin? One million years plus. Okay. Look at this. He has a fellow laborer who owes him $1. How much was a day's wage? Penny. Penny. In a hundred days, if this guy saved everything that he made, which is probably obviously not possible, but if he saved everything he made, he could pay it off his fellow laborer in 100 days. Less than, let's say he could have easily done it in a year, right? Yeah. I mean, he could have easily cut that in third and in a year's time. He, he could have paid his debt. We find a man who has been forgiven a king's ransom who he couldn't have worked hard enough to get it paid off, to pay the debt off. He's owed a king's, he owes a king's ransom. That king's ransom is forgiven. He finds somebody who a hundred days of work could have paid him off. And he takes him by the throat. You talk about the violence. Can you see this man who had been forgiven so much, who grabs his buddy and owed him a buck? And I can see him picking up by him, grabbing him by his throat and say, you better pay me what you owe me. Jesus Christ died on an old rugged cross, forgave us of all, and somebody looked at you cross-eyed, and you will never forgive them. That's good. Some of you are probably angry with me right now. Is this a true story? You better believe it's true. Especially in the Independent Baptist Church. Yep. That church down there. That pastor. That, I've heard it and heard it and heard it. And to be honest with you, I'm tired of hearing it. 
Because do you realize what God has forgiven you? Do I realize what God has forgiven me? I've been through some hurtful situations. I'm not going to lie to you. We left the church situation, and I was hurt. And it took me a long time to get over that. It took me a long time to forgive that pastor. I understand. I see the reality. But I also see the bigger reality of Christ forgave me in one day on an old red cross far more than I ever could forgive someone else. Of what they do to me. 70 times 7 every day or every hour. Jesus Christ forgave far more than what has ever happened to me in my life. I want you to consider the, the violence of this man for literally a hundred days of work compared to a million dollars, four million dollars. Doesn't compare. They set my view. If you're that offended by somebody sitting in your pew, there's something wrong with your Christianity. There is something wrong, and to be quite honest with you, I'm not trying to be mean, and I'm not the judge, but I would check up on your salvation if you're that concerned about the pew you're sitting in. Yeah. Show me in the Bible where it says, Thou shalt conform thyself to the image of thy pew. <laughs> or thy pew shall conform itself to the image of you. Yeah, that's good. I, I paid for that pew. Did you? Let me ask you a question. Would you have had any money to pay for the pew had it not been for God? So who's in the right and who's in the wrong? I'm telling you of some of the silliness that goes on in churches today, and it causes a lack of forgiveness, and we wonder why our churches aren't growing. Why would you want to come somewhere when somebody had been given a king, forgiven of a king's ransom, but won't forgive somebody who didn't mention your name in the bulletin? Or who didn't mention your name from the pulpit? I'll never forgive him. I worked so hard on that project and he never said a word about me. How much has God forgiven us? I want you to notice the violence. And I want you to know the same plea happens from this fellow servant as happened in his life. Listen, doesn't it look kind of foolish when you're begging? I mean, let's just be honest. We were looking at that guy's begging. It looks kind of foolish. He looks like a fool. He's down there crying and begging for mercy. Well, the reality is this guy cried and begged for mercy. He looked like a fool. And he takes a guy who's a buddy of his, apparently, and he says, you owe me a hundred pence. Give it to me now. And pay it now or I'm going to throw you in prison. I'm going to take your wife and your children. I'm going to do it. And in verse 29 it says, and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee the exact all. He said, I will pay thee all. I'll give it all to you. Because it was possible for him to give all. He could have just worked a little extra, maybe. He could have got a second job, maybe. I don't know. He said, I'll pay all. And I believe this man was honest, and he was sincere. He said, I'll pay all. I want you to notice not only the plea for patience, but the prison. In verse 30, and he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. There's far too many Christians that won't do for others what they expect God to do for them. That's right. Right? God, you promised that you were a forgiving God. You promised that if I confess my sin, which most of us probably won't admit that we have sin, why would you go to God and confess anything that you never do? <laughs> or I never do. As Alden said, I'm preaching to me right now. I'm preaching at me. Because we can live in a state of unforgiveness. When it is God who has forgiven us so much. That's good. Can I tell you, this man threw him in prison. In verse 31, I want you to see what the people see. The people see our pharisaical, if you will, if that's a word. Our, the way we live as Pharisees. Well, we want God to forgive us, but we're not forgiving them because they did something that we don't agree with. Look at verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. And came unto their Lord all, or it came unto their Lord all that was done. And told, excuse me, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. We see what the people see. The people see that we can be Pharisees. Yeah. We don't practice what we preach. That's good. Mrs. Fuller 
in the last year bought me a plaque and, and it is uh, something that I have in my, my room. And I was reading it once again this morning. I try to read it every day because I... I know I'm not the best pastor out there. I know sometimes I don't have as much compassion as I need for my own people. Sometimes I don't have the compassion I need for my own children. I start to realize every day I know how much more I need God. And that plaque says, Pastor, thank you for being there for us through our times of struggles. and our, We know that you're there. We know that you're praying for us. And I sit back and I say, am I praying as much as I should? I know the Bible says Jesus even prays for me. <laughs> How much more should I be praying for others? And as a pastor, I fall short. You know what? That's why I need God every day. I can't do it by myself. As a dad, I don't wear shirts that say number, number one dad because I know I fail. Yeah. I'm not saying I wouldn't wear one if my kids bought They just won't buy them. They want me to be one because they know I'm not perfect. <laughs> oh, I may be their favorite dad, but I'm also the only dad they know. So when it says world's best dad, does it also mean he's the world's worst dad? There's times. Times where dad isn't a very good example. It makes me realize instead of picking on everybody else and casting stones on everybody else, I probably should be looking in the mirror. It's like going to somebody and saying, hey, your hair's messed up. And they turn around and say, did you look in the mirror? Your hair's a mess too. I don't really have that problem, but God has forgiven us so much. Why can't we forgive? It's human. It's selfish. It's not correct. It's not biblically correct. But the people see that we can be Pharisees. They don't practice what they preach. They're not doing what they say they're supposed to be doing. They're not winning souls like they say they're supposed to be winning souls. They're not telling people about Jesus like they say they should. We're more wrapped up in, oh, well, we can come together as a church. That's a wonderful thing. But what about the Bible says, I notice it doesn't say, it's, it does say forsake not the assembling of thyselves together. But it also says go ye therefore. And we know, we can say, oh yeah, we need to be witnessing. But when we're out there, we're too wrapped up in ourselves. And we forget to hand out a track. We forget to tell somebody about Jesus. Because we're wrapped up in what we're doing. How quickly we can forget what Jesus has done for us. And the people go to the Lord and say, listen, this is what happened. In verse 32, it says, Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. You asked me to forgive, and I forgave you all that debt. I want you to consider the people, and then I want you to consider in verses 32 through 34, really the punishment. The punishment. Verse 32, it goes, or 3, it says, Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on that? You know what Jesus told? You remember, the, since we're using the story at times of the Good Samaritan, somebody tell me what the end of that story Jesus tells, tell, tells the man that's asking the question what to do. Go and do Thou likewise. When Christ has forgiven us of everything we've ever done, He can forgive us. You know what He wants us to do? Go and do thou likewise to others. Go forgive everyone else. Now I know we can't forgive them of their sin, but we can say, you know what? I forgive you of what you've done. I forgive you of what's happened. I, I'm not going to hold that against you. I'm not going to hold a grudge. I'm not going to let that plague me in my life. I'm not going to let that keep me from serving God the way I need to serve God. You know how we need to serve God? Without baggage. Yeah. When we carry unforgiveness in our hearts, we're carrying baggage that will keep us from doing the will of God. Shouldst not thou have compassion and pity on that servant? Verse 34, his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. I don't know about you, but I don't want to pay my sin debt. 
I'm glad Jesus Christ did it for me on the cross Amen. of Calvary. Amen. And I'm glad I can receive Him as my Savior and call upon Him. And I'm glad I was able to do that at a young age. And I'm thankful for the opportunity and the privilege to come before a God and He's not mad at us and angry at us or bitter at us when we make sure that we're saved. Amen. We get assurance of that salvation. There may be somebody sitting here in the service today that you're in your 20s or in your 30s or in your 40s and you got saved when you were a little kid, but you're still doubting your salvation. Yeah. And you're too proud and you're too arrogant and you're too embarrassed and you're too whatever you want to throw in there to say, I, I don't want to go back forward and make sure. I don't know what people will think of me. And I tell you this morning, it doesn't matter what people think of you. It matters what God knows about you. Amen. Amen. Does he know you're born again today? Does he know you're a child of his? Hey, by the way, the last time I checked, the Bible says 12 of you are with me, but one of you is a devil. Yeah. Don't think for one minute that there's not people in churches today, and I'm talking good Bible-believing churches today. Don't think for one minute that there's not people sitting in the pews that are not regenerated, not born again. Well, just because they come to church, they must be saved. No. You can look the part. You can play the part. Yeah. Yeah. I can get up here and preach. I can get up here and sleep and sing. I can get up here and sing a song. Don't mean my heart's right with God. That's right. Lots of people can sing. Lots of people can play music. Lots of people can do a lot of things. A lot of people are doing it on their own power and not in God's strength. Yeah. The punishment was this man who had been forgiven so much who would not forgive Forgive, Jesus tells us in the model prayer, if you will, as we call it. Hey, listen, forgive, let us, may we forgive.